Oh man, we are almost at the end of the journey. This wonderful journey in which it is possible for you now, right now, today, to be fully at home in the fellowship of God who loves you so much as you are learning the secret of the easy yoke. Jesus says, take my yoke on you, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Which involves growing increasingly able to effortlessly do whatever Jesus would do if he were in your place, if he had your job, if he had your role, if he lived in your home. And we do this by arranging our lives around those practices and activities that Jesus himself engaged in. To be fully at home in the fellowship of his Father and receiving that power on a regular basis. And we've been learning about the practices of abstaining from certain things and engaging in certain things and coming to understand that they are all about freedom, being able to do the right thing at the right time. I don't try to do spiritual disciplines to prove I'm a spiritual person. The disciplined person can just do the right thing at the right time. And that power flows through them. You may be aware, we talked about confession the last time. There was at Asbury University recently a revival. It's a very powerful experience of God's presence and God being at work on that campus. I was just reading about the president of the student body said it began when one student confessed their sins to their small group. And I knew that that's what would be said because this is just very, very consistent. Anytime there's a great revival, a very powerful movement like that, it will always be characterized by confession. There is something electric that happens when somebody confesses. And those kind of revivals are not anything that we can or should try to manufacture. Sometimes they can be characterized by such a high level of emotion that they may end up long-term doing as much harm as good. But when the Spirit is at work in them, people will all of a sudden have a sense of the manifestation, the presence, and the power of God that can be transforming and very powerful. But it began with confession. So now today we're looking at the final one of these practices. This may be the most countercultural practice that we will talk about. Dallas Willard writes about it in the spiritual, uh, the spirit of the disciplines, and it's called the discipline of submission. We all want to do that, don't we? I am living my life in submission to others. My child is the most submissive student at Alpine Elementary School. Isn't that a popular bumper sticker? The highest lovely rites of fellowship involving humility, complete honesty, transparency, see, at times confession and restitution is sustained by the discipline of submission. In the letter to the Hebrews, we read, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not grief in first peter those older in the way are told to take the oversight of the flock of god not by being forced to do so and not as lords over god's heritage but by, but as examples to the flock. The younger are then told to submit themselves to this gentle oversight by the elders. This is the way spiritual community is to work, in mutual submission. All of you be subject one to the other and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. That is a theme that runs all throughout the Bible. The order in the redemptive community here implied, obviously, is not a matter of an iron hierarchy, some people in charge bossing around those who are underneath them. Um, uh, where unwilling souls are crushed and driven. Instead, it functions in the power of truth and mercy, inhabiting mature personalities, being the expression of a kingdom not of this world. Otherwise, the church would just be one more human government, and human governments are driven by coercive power. That's why we often think that politics is the real relevant sphere, because it has the power of coercion behind it. That's not the way of Jesus. Now, it is a very countercultural thing to think of submitting. In fact, it will often sound so strange to our ears, we can't quite account for it. Yale prof Stephen Carter wrote about the nature of spiritual community. 
And he talks about a situation, real life situation, in which a woman fell in love and she was not sure whether or not she ought to get married to this man that she loved. So she went to her spiritual community, particularly the leaders of it, and laid the situation out and then said, I will submit myself to your guidance. What you tell me I ought to do is what I will do. Carter writes out, often in our day, people who write about spiritual life because we value autonomy so much will say, this is a clear place case of spiritual abuse. She just needs to be able to decide for herself. This religious community must be an abusive community. The woman that he was writing about was a real person named Maria von Trapp. If you have ever seen the movie The Sound of Music, it is the story of her life. And she was part of a spiritual community where that was the nature of the commitments that were involved. And her superiors in that community said, yes, by all means, you must do this. But that sounds so foreign to us, we think it must be abusive. Now, the idea in submission is not that we abdicate agency or personhood. There's a reason why we do this. Submission is a call for help to those recognized as able to give it because of their depth of experience and Christ-likeness, because they truly are elder in the way. In submission, we engage the experience of those in our fellowship who are qualified to direct our efforts in growth and who then add the weight of their wise authority on the side of our willing spirit to help us to do the things we would like to do and refrain from the things we don't want to do. They oversee the godly order in our souls. We are so captivated by autonomy and independence and egalitarianism that it's hard for us even to acknowledge, yep, there are people farther along the way than me and I need their wisdom. How truly blessed in this free order are those uh, who are willing to submit. It's a, crude, a taste of case of true leadership, Dallas says, not of the drivership so often prevailing in secular society, but of servant leadership. Now, uh, if you know about 12-step communities, you will know in, um, in that fellowship, people will be always encouraged to find a sponsor. And this is a picture of a relationship of appropriate and responsible submission. I go to somebody who is farther along than me and who knows how to work the program. And they love me and they don't shame me, but they also have really good antenna for when I'm trying to wiggle out of doing something or get my own way. And they call me to account um, in that culture it is said that one of the ways that your sponsor is different than your therapist is the only time your sponsor uses the word closure, it is followed by the word mouth. Because there's this spirit of tough love that says, nope, I also um, have been one who needs to submit myself to the program, to the way, and I know how clever the ego and the will are at trying to get their own way, and I love you enough not to allow you to do that without calling you to that higher self that God wants you to be. So, um, how do we go about practicing submission? Well, I would encourage you today, very simply, think about who are some people you would like to be like whose character and spiritual life you admire. Just identify them, and then you might begin by asking them a question. I'm deeply grateful for people who became guides and leaders, spiritual fathers in my own life. I remember Jerry Hawthorne, a teacher in college, and he said to me and some others, you ought to consider the possibility of devoting your life to the care of Jesus' church. And that's part of why I became a pastor. I think about my friend John Anderson. He was the first boss that I worked for. And he said to me, one concern I have for you is you have not had to suffer very much. And you need to be very intentional about remaining close to Jesus. 
And one of the reasons that I was so hungry for Dallas Willard and his influence when I found it was those words that I received from John Anderson. I remember Neil Clark Warren in talking with him about sexuality one time many decades ago and him saying, now this is something, here's a habit where I think you just ought to renounce this and agree not to do it and do whatever you need to do not to do it. And that was so helpful to me. I think about my friend Sam Reeves who said to me not too long ago, you need to have a daily experience of cultivating, honing your craft, offering it to God. Don't give that up. And that was a real life-changing thing just in the last couple of years. So grateful for those people in my life. So today, just pause and think. Who is at least one person where when you look at them, how they lead their life, their wisdom, their character, you admire them? And what's one question you could ask them? And then do what you say. Actually begin to submit thoughtfully, wisely to their directive leadership in your life. That's the very powerful practice of submission. And I hope that one will help you because that's all I got. But come back tomorrow because we need to have one more conversation. Welcome home. Hey, I'm Tim. Thanks for joining us here at Become New. We hope that these videos help you to grow spiritually one day at a time. If you want to access our whole library of videos, or if you want to subscribe to the daily emails or text messages that go along with each video, head on over to becomenew.com and you can let us know there. We're also preparing some exclusive leadership content. So if you're interested in that, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash leadership. And lastly, if you've got a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. You can let us know by texting it to 855-888-0444. See you next time.